गुड आफ्टरनून मैडम सी ज्वाइन हेलो सालनी मैडम गुड आफ्टरनून उनको आवाज नहीं जा रही गुड आफ्टरनून सालिनी मैडम कैन यू हियर मी हेलो सालिनी मैडम कैन यू हियर मी कैन एवरी वन हियर मी यस सर गुड आफ्टरनून वी कैन हियर यस सर यस सर हां सालिनी मैडम इज नॉट रिस्पोंडिंग एट ऑल हेलो हेलो मैडम
हेलो सालनी मैडम आर यू एबल टू हियर हाँ ओके पूर्णिमा सेल वी स्टार्ट और वी विल स्टार्ट है वी कैन स्टार्ट सर इज टू थर्टी टू बट सम मोर पार्टिसिपेंट्स वुड हैव शॉल वी शॉल वी स्टार्ट और शॉल वी वेट फॉर टू मिनट्स विल वेट फॉर टू थ्री मिनट टू मिनट्स एंड देन विल स्टार्ट यस अच्छा Unima, we will start. Okay, sir. Okay. Uh, other will join. Yes, sir. Sure. Uh, so, good afternoon to all. On behalf of Institution Innovation Council, Goa University, uh, myself, Dr. Purnima Dume, welcome you all for the webinar on uh, intellectual property rights and IP management for startup. um uh, the resource person for this uh, today's session is uh, advocate shalini menezes uh, i extend my warm welcome to you ma'am for this session uh, today's session we have actually the first session which is going to be for 1 hour uh, that is from 2:30 to 3:30 followed by second session after a 15 minutes break we are going to begin at 3:45 to 4:45 uh, so to briefly introduce uh, ma'am shalini Uh, Shalini Menezes is an advocate by profession. She is a member of Bar Council. She is also a registered Indian patent agent. Uh, she uh, with a technical background in physics and biophysics, and uh, training with a particular emphasis on uh, corporate and IPR management. Uh, to uh, just briefly uh, give a background of her education, she has uh, MSc in laser and plasma physics. Uh, she has MS degree in biophysics from Ohio uh, State University, USA. Uh, she uh, she has done her LLB in IPR specialization from IIT Kharagpur and LLM in corporate law specialization. Uh, at present, she is uh, uh, she is having her independent practice. uh supporting uh supporting clients through key steps of innovation and growth process helping them identify the corporate entity suited to uh, their business needs uh, along with ways to generate value from ip licensing uh, with potential partners capitalizing on protected and unprotected ip landscaping patent infringement analysis licensing and technology transfer Uh, apart from her achievement she also has uh, many uh, national and international publications to her credit um along with various certifications so with this brief introduction i would like to hand over uh, this session to ma'am shalini thank you ma'am purnima a very good yes. afternoon to all of you i am going to Uh, start my presentation right is my screen visible professor garg yes yes it is it is visible ma'am okay yeah right. i just I close my uh, close uh, my screen okay thank you yeah it is visible you can go ahead okay. a very good afternoon to all of you dear participants we have two sessions today back to back the first one is on intellectual property rights and the second one is on ip management so once we have the basics of intellectual property rights complete we shall uh, see what ip management means and how we can achieve it we have 
when we talk of intellectual property, let's first understand what's property. Over the years, the concept of property has evolved to mean various things. At different points of time, depending on what the socioeconomic structure was, there was a different concept of property. So, for example, fourth century, we had conflicting views on property, where one, where Plato said that there is a common property and thereby you, the state is unified. Whereas Aristotle said that property should not be common. Each person should have their own property depending on how much they can work towards it and how much they can achieve. Uh, Aristotle's views uh, are more capitalistic in nature, whereas Plato's views are more socialistic in nature. And the prevailing view finally is John Locke's, which says that private property is the basis of state. So this means that once there is a concept of property, that is the basis for state or the government to exist. The two are in intricately intertwined with each other. Proudhon, who was the precursor to Karl Marx, held that property is theft. Why did he say that? Because he was on, his take was that the employers, the employees who work, and it is their the product of their labor, the fruits of their labor that are uh, that are harvested or reaped by the employer. They're enjoyed by the employer, but in the, but it is akin to the employees having sold their arms and having parted with their liberty. So the ones who work for it, work for something, to produce something, to manufacture something, they are the rightful owners, according to Trudeau. Now, when we talk of property, we realize that if there was no concept of property, if there was no concept of ownership, then law does not make any sense because there is nothing to uphold, no rights to uphold. And vice versa, if there is no law, if there is no one to complain to, if there is no one to decide who is right and who is wrong, then the concept of property doesn't exist either. So the two, like I said a couple of slides earlier, the two are intertwined with each other and we cannot separate one from the other. Neither can survive without the other. When you hear the word property, you should think of this picture, no matter what property it is, be it your land, be it your ancestral house, be it your flat, be it your umbrella or your uh, pair of glasses. When you think of property, you should always think of this image. It is a bundle of rights. So when I am talking about giving away my property, when I'm talking of willing it or gifting it or selling it, then the picture on the right with a rubber band around it comes into play because I'm giving all the rights to the other person. However, if I'm merely selling, if I'm merely licensing it, leasing it, mortgaging it, or giving it, uh, taking it to the pawn shop, then I'm only giving few of the sticks away. So the picture on the left comes into play. So depending on what you are going to do with your property, you are either giving the entire bundle away or you're going to give a few sticks away. And as we have, so this is the evolution of property from the time we have started to live as a civilized society. And as we are growing intellectually, the focus of property jurisprudence has shifted from tangibles to intangibles, where earlier 20 years ago, you used to 20, I mean, 40 years ago, you used to read in the papers about theft of gold or a smuggling of gold, in today's day and age, you are reading about data. Every time you take that little quiz on Facebook about what country you belong to or what your name means, you are giving data to Facebook. Each time you fill out your details in a form to purchase something online, you are giving your details to that person, to that business owner. So data has become, data or intangibles have become the focus of property jurisprudence. And underlying all of this new, newly evolved focus on property, intellectual property rights now are in the spotlight. So what do I have intellectual, prop what does intellectual property comprise of? Your tangible property, you know, land, houses, estate, cars, pen, books, 
whatever you are interested in. Intangible property is intellectual property. It is something that is a creation of the mind. It is something that has to have a physical, has to be put in the physical form and it can be easily appropriated, meaning it can be easily stolen and reproduced. And once it is created, the marginal cost of reproduction, the marginal cost of making further copies is negligible. Those are its characteristics. Anything I can do with regular property, I can do with IP. I can sell it, I can buy it, I can gift it, I can lease it, I can pass it under will, I can assign it. Right? So it is as it, it is as diverse and it is as flexible as your regular property. Now comes the formal definition. When I say intellectual property, it is something that is produced using human intellect. The word human intellect is of utmost importance here. Why is it of utmost importance? As we go further in the talk, we are going to come across a case where human intellect is not at play. So would it still be intellectual property? We'll come to that. We'll cross that bridge when we come to it. For now, let's let's take it for granted that something produced using human intellect and which has commercial value. That is the second important thing. If it is produced using human intellect, but it doesn't have commercial value, then it does not count as property. Right? Would you have a would you buy a piece of land which cannot be sold later? because it cannot be commercialized? No, we always buy property, real property for investment reasons. Therefore, commercial value is extremely important. And in the same way, in intellectual property, once it is produced, it has to have commercial importance. Only then can it be classified as intellectual property. And the second main characteristic is that it is intangible in nature. We cannot touch, see, feel, hear it because it but a physical medium a tangible medium is required when we go for registration you cannot go to the patent office or the trademark office saying i have an idea it's in my head i need protection for it he's going to say please leave the room right you have to have it has to be either written on a piece of paper or a working model or a C, or on a cd pen drive computer chips and so on I am going to draw a difference now between IP and IPR. It is not a very crucial, but you often hear both of these terms being used interchangeably. And so we should know before we embark on knowing more about IPR, what is IP and what is IPR? IP is the underlying asset and IPR is your statutory registration. What do I mean by that? I have an invention that is the intellectual property. I have a, well, we don't have discoveries. I have a method of doing something that is the intellectual property. When I apply for registration, that registration becomes the IPR. I have a brand name, that brand name is my IP. When I apply for a trademark registration, that registration becomes the IPR. So we do use it interchangeably, IP and IPR. IPR is the overarching term. So if you are in a doubt, always use go with IPR because it covers IP as well as the rights associated with it. We have, if I have to define who is Shalini, right? there are two definitions. One is Shalini is, um, in, she's Indian born, she's 5'4", she has dark hair, dark eyes, etc. If you have to give an intentional definition, you will say she's a uh, she's a kind person. She's a, or not or an unkind person. She her she's got a beautiful handwriting. She has uh, she speaks very fast or she speaks very slow. Those are the intentional definitions. So in the same way, we have for intellectual property an extensional and an intentional definition. So an intentional definition we can look at it as, as a more philosophical view of intellectual property. And this is the last slide of this philosophical discussion. After this, we are going to move into IP and IPR. <coughs> so it is, I would call it liberty, including privileges of a special kind. 
why is it liberty intruding because when i try to establish my right when i try to say that this is mine this is my patents i am intruding on someone else's privileges but it is of a special kind because i am protected by law in saying that this is mine so that intruding intrusion that i do is protected is backed by government by the patent office by the trademark office and the second definition is that they are rule governed privileges of course because there are statutory rights for everything that regulate ownership so it tells you who is the owner for how long is he the owner how can he renew the ownership if he if at all he can and exploitation of abstract objects in many fields of human activity now we're going to go to the ex extensional definition and then on into in depth into each kind of ip we have copyright and we have industrial property now if you notice i should have made two columns here copyright is of one sort and then i have industrial property which comprises of trademarks patents industrial designs confidential information geographical indications trade secrets biodiversity act semiconductor and integrated circuit act right we are not going to have time to cover all of those today but we will at least know that these are covered under industrial property why isn't copyright covered under industrial property the reason copyright is not covered under industrial property is because it is something that is that protection is granted for works of art for literary dramatic musical artistic works cinematographic film sound recording and those are works of art which may or may not be sold in the market which may or may not be commercializable and therefore we draw a distinction between copyright as an intellectual property and industrial property as an intellectual property trademarks patents industrial designs confidential information trade secrets um semiconductor and integrated circuits act all those are industrial in nature which means it is used in research and development in marketing in manufacturing industry in taking something to the market and making money off of it and having some sort of a revenue that is generated by that copyright on the other hand is entirely for the soul it is entirely for the purpose of human enjoyment it is for our for the aesthetic craving in us and therefore it may or may not i may write a poem and i can copyright it will i sell it in the market sure i can go and sell it will i make money probably not i can write a song i can create a little movie clip at home uh, acting doing some skit or acting in some play and that i can copyright that but am i going to uh, commercialize it it may not sell it may be the only copy in the world and that is okay but it is still copyrighted so that is the extensional definition look at i'm sure all of you all have your phones within uh, within arms reach i want you all to take a look at your phone what do you see do you see the logo if it's an iphone or a samsung or a nokia or a motorola do you see the trademark somewhere it does show up when you restart your phone correct you hear a particular melody a jingle when you restart your phone or when your phone rings samsung has a particular tune that is its own iphone has a tune that is its own motorola has a tune that's its own that goes under either copyright or design or it can also be trademark sounds can also be trademark you have a panel a glass panel lcd panel that technology is patented you can listen to radio on your phone right so there is an antenna structure in there there is you have rounded corners maybe a circular home button some sort of a uh, touching uh, touch screen facility so that goes into your design and so you are looking at this single piece that we take for granted and there are all these 
various intellectual property rights that come into play when you are using your phone on a daily basis. And that is the importance of intellectual property rights in our life. So let's start with copyrights. And I know I said that copyright is not industrial property. However, as academicians, given that we are constantly publishing papers, journal articles, we are distributing notes, we are preparing question papers, we are preparing notes for our students, we are writing books, we are translating material that, that we find interesting and we think that the future generation can enjoy. Copyright is of utmost importance to us for those of us in the academia. In its strictest meaning, copyright translates to a copier of words. Before the, before the printing press, before Joseph Gutenberg came into existence, pe the people who used to write books, they would not make 100 copies copies because there wasn't any Xerox photocopying machine. There wasn't any uh, carbon paper to make multiple copies. So what do you do? They either spoke and someone took down the manuscript or they wrote the original manuscript and they had their novices or their assistants or their disciples who made copies. And so the word copyright implies that the person who is making copies does not have any rights. The attribution will not be to that person who is making those copies. It is to the person who wrote the original work. So Vyasa wrote the Mahabharata or he dictated it to uh, Ganesha. Ganesha did not use his intellect. He was merely transcribing what was told to him by Vyasa. So Vyasa is the owner of the copyright. Balmiki is the owner of, of course, now those copyrights don't exist. And of course, it didn't exist when these epics were written. But if they were written now, then that would that was that is how it would work out. The a Black's Law Dictionary says transcript, imitation, reproduction of an original writing, painting, instrument, or the like. So these are the various meanings of the word copyright. And we are going to see what it means in in today's day and age. Copyright Act says that it is the exclusive right to do or authorize others to do. So it is the exclusive right. If I hold a copyright, I have the exclusive right to do or authorize, say, Purnima ma'am, to do certain acts in relation to my copyrighted works. If I write a play, I can give the right to convert it into a novel to Purnima ma'am. If I write a poem, I can give the right to convert it to a song to one of the other faculty. Artistic works, cinematographic film and sound recording. Certain acts, either I can do myself or I can allow someone, give someone the right to do it on my behalf. What does copyright protect? Copyright does not protect ideas. If you have to take one thing away from today's talk, in addition to that uh, bundle of rights slide I told you, it is this, that copyright does not protect ideas. In copyright, we have this concept called idea expression dichotomy, which means, which says that for every idea, there can be a multiple, say millions of different, different expressions. I have the idea of a sunset. I can have a song. I can have a poem. I can have a watercolor painting. I can have a pencil sketch. I can have an oil painting. And all those embody that sunset. I go, let's say we all go for a picnic together, right? Now the pandemic is lifted and we want to go for a picnic. Let's say we go to Mahavir Udyan. When we go to Mahavir Udyan, we see the river, Mandavi River, and we see uh, lots of plants, greenery, and we see bees. Now, from those bees, either I can come home and I can write a poem on the bees, 
I can write a song, I can paint the beads, or I can design jewelry. And all of those can be copyrighted. So that idea of the bee or the idea of the sunset cannot be protected, but the various expressions of it can be protected. That is the idea expression dichotomy. And typically, protection lasts for the life of the author plus 70 years. And for commercial authors, it is 95 years from date of publication. You remember the bundle of rights slide we talked about? Copyright gives the owner a bundle of rights. What are those rights? If it was a piece of land, it would be right to sell, right to lease, right to gift, etc. In copyright, it is the right to reproduction, translation, abridgment, revision, derivative works, public distribution, public performance, and display. So when I talk about a bundle of rights, this is what I'm talking about. That bundle of sticks, one of those sticks will be the right to reproduction, meaning to copy those works in various forms. The second stick will say translation, abridgment, revision, um, con derivative works, that is converting a book into a movie or a play into a movie or a book into a play, public distribution, how will I sell it? Where will I sell it? Which countries will I sell it in? And public performance and display. Okay. Now, again, because we are all in academia, a crucial point that comes up, a crucial question that always comes up is the difference between author's rights and owner's rights. I'll give you a story. David Slater was, is a photographer, a wildlife photographer. And he was trying to photograph this macaque monkey. And he was unsuccessful. So what did he do? You remember those Kodak disposable cameras? So he took a whole bunch of those Kodak disposable cameras and he planted it into in the forest at the daily haunts, at the usual haunts of this monkey, group of monkeys. This particular monkey, whom we are calling Naruto, walked up to that camera, got interested in it, and ended up clicking a selfie. And threw the camera there, and David Slater went back later and picked it up. And we, you know, we are not sure how. Slater was very impressed with this image. So he started advertising his work using this picture. Wikipedia took that picture and put it on its page about Naruto monkey. So Wikipedia, if you have gone there, in the, uh, if you visited Wikipedia, you know that whenever they have a page, let's say it's about Priyanka Chopra, then there is a picture of Priyanka Chopra. If it is a picture about um, Indian parliament, there is a picture of a parliamentary house. And so on their picture, on their page about the macaque monkey, they had a picture of Naruto. Slater sues Wikipedia saying, I am the owner. PETA, which is a society for ethical treatment of animals, sues Slater, says that any proceeds that are, uh, that are awarded in this judgment should belong to the monkey. And since the monkey cannot take collect it from you, we are in charge of the monkey and we will collect it for the monkey. Okay. So, yeah, remember the first few slides where I talked about human intellect. Is a work of art, that is an animal capable of creating a work of art? Let's say the answer to that is yes. You give a monkey certain paints or you give a monkey a typewriter, the monkey will come up with a novel. Can that be classified as a work of intellect? Can that be classified as a work of art that needs to be copyrighted? Let's say, okay, it can be copyrighted. In which case, if it is commercialized, who gets the money? What is an animal going to do with commercial proceeds? So these are all questions that the court was fighting about. And it was finally held that the, uh, the copyright shall be held by David Slater and proceeds shall, some proceeds will go to 
to preservation of that monkey. But the dis distinction between author and owner is clear here. If I do a work, make a work, work, sorry, if I make a work of art, I am the author. If I am doing it as a freelancer, then I'm also the owner. If I'm employed by someone who, uh, for the purpose of creating that work of art, then even though I am the author, my employer is the owner. If I write articles, uh, Com if I draw comics, let's say I am a lawyer and I'm drawing comics in my spare time, then I am the author and I'm the owner. But if I am hired by Times of India to produce a weekly comic strip, then Times of India is the owner and I am the author. I shall be credited so, but the ownership rights reside with my employer. Now, when you are academicians, you have to know whether what you are doing, creating works of art, is it in your scope of employment or not? Your writing journal articles is within the scope. It is in your job description when you are hired as faculty. So it, so the university becomes the owner and you become the author. Writing question papers, writing chapters, all these are the university is the owner and you are the author. Now, if it is something else, you are a physics professor and you have written a poem, then you are the author and you are the owner because there is nowhere in your job description as a physics physics professor that says that you have to write one poetry a month. But it could be in the job description of the person who is teaching literature. So you have to know what your job description stipulates of you. Then we have creative commons at work where you give people very light. So in this case, that's a picture of my son. And there's me in the back uh, with my other son picking strawberry. And my husband has taken the picture. Travel Portland, which is a magazine in Portland, has taken this picture and put it on their cover page. Should I have been upset about it? Should I sue them? No, because creative commons are at work where you allow someone certain things for your creative, for your work. What are those things? I can either say that you cannot use my work at all, or I can say you can use my work as it is, but you have to give me credit and you can make money off of it. Or I can say that you cannot make money off of my work, or I can say that you can use my work, uh, but, uh, and you can make derivative works of it. Or I can say that you can use my work uh, and create derivative works of it and sell it and make money. So those are the various attributions. When you read something, when you are looking at a website, please always read the attribution. And finally, we also deal with, uh, in, after Creative Commons, we are all, another thing we deal with is copy left. Please note that copy left Ideologically is the opposite of copyright, but it does not mean that something is free. It means that something is free for the purpose of the changes you can make into it and you can distribute it and you can charge for the distributed work to the changed version that you are selling. So I can have a copyright that I, sorry, a computer program that I download that is free, that is copy left or not copyrighted. And then I can make certain changes to the source code. Then I can sell that changed source code and it is no longer free, that particular version. That is copy left. And one more thing that we deal with as academicians is when is it okay to copy something and when is it okay, how much is okay? If I'm using a short excerpt, so section 51 of the copyright talks about it. I don't make a profit. I haven't substantially copied the work. I have, a sh I'm using a short excerpt. I am uh, using safe harbor provision. I am using it for a government performance. I am using it for private study. I'm using it for parody, for satire. The Exceptions are ebooks. So you need to look up what is the license agreement on ebooks. And in 
uh, the other common question I deal with in fair, fair use or fair dealing is, uh, can I photocopy a book? In one word, the answer is no. But if your library has a copy of the book and you're not using it because we are, again, we have to understand our failures or our limitations, right? We may not be able to access expensive books. Uh, so in that case, a small portion of the book you may photocopy. But uh, of the book and distributing would be illegal copyright infringement. Copyright and ethics is another favorite topic of mine. And we have faced this as academicians, correct? SciHub is a website started by Alexandra Elbakyan, a national uh, Kazakhstan uh, woman from Kazakhstan. And uh, we all know that during the pandemic, a lot of us could not access university websites. We could not reach the campus. And uh, we still had to work. Life had to go on. Work had to go on. So we started accessing SciHub to download papers. And she was taken to court. And I think now Sai Hub is defunct. Uh, so she was taken to court and the matter is not yet decided, I think. Uh, but you, you know how much uh, per article is charged or how much each journalist is, uh, how much each journal costs. So, uh, uh, and these publishing houses are making uh, obscene amounts of profits uh, and the people who are actually doing the hard work that is the people who are writing papers are not making any money so i have the answer to this it is illegal or legal i myself have used sahab and uh, i do talk about it and i don't have an answer the next Topic in this field of intellectual property is trademark. If you're walking down the road and you see a yellow M, big yellow M, the clown sitting on a bench outside it, you know what they are selling, correct? If you open a website and there is a blue F on a white background, you know what that website is. You know what, if there is A and Z written and there's an arrow underneath, you know what that website is. So these are trademarks. These are trademarks that tell you that these goods or these services belong to this particular service provider or this particular individual. And this is going to be the quality of goods or services that you can expect from that service provider. It is a word phrase, symbol, or design, or a combination of these that identifies the source of goods or services and distinguishes it from those of the others. So if I'm talking of words, I have crest, I have Coca-Cola, I have phrases saying just do it. I also have colors. You see the red and white can, you know it is Coca-Cola. You see a yellow M, you know it's McDonald's. So these, so colors can also be in it. When you start, a, if I blindfold everyone and I start a phone, based on the starting ringtone, you can tell me which phone it is. And that is, a, that is an example of a sound mark, color mark, that is this red, red background and white cursive writing Coca-Cola. So I can have word mark, I can have phrases, I can have sound, I can have texture. I can have color. Symbols, of course. And service mark is the same as a trademark, except that instead of goods, it is for services. So Amazon or Flipkart would be services, examples of services. Now, when I use the word mark and trademark interchangeably, and it means the same thing. This is what a trademark registration looks like when you finally get it from the Indian Trademark Office. So what is the function of a trademark? 
It indicates where the goods and services have originated from. It helps me guarantee what is the quality of goods. It tells me it creates loyalty. It can be used as a marketing tool. It creates and maintains a demand for the product. And when there is a trademark, it adds immense value to the company if it is leveraged properly. Why do you need to protect a trademark? Again, for the same reason said earlier. I can use a TM or SM when I haven't applied for it or if it is an application and I use the R with the circle when it is registered. When you think of trademarks, I needed to think of this arrows. At the bottom is generic. So zipper, actually that is trademark, but they made it generic. Same thing with Xerox. Descriptive, spray and wash. Suggestive, copper tone. It suggests that you will get a copper tone. Arbitrary, dove. Fanciful, exon. Agindas. So I want to be in the top half of this. I want to be arbitrary or fanciful. Preferably fanciful. Okay. I don't want to be suggestive, descriptive or generic. I'm going to skip through this. I think I've told you about trademark. I'm going to skip to patents because we will run out of time. I do tend to spend a little more time on patents. I find this statement very funny because in 1977, someone had made the statement that there is no reason anyone would want a computer in their home. This is the era of mainframes and punch card and so on. So what was he thinking that caused him to make such a statement? That what was he envisioning that people would want to do or not want to do that they would not need a computer in their home? He, maybe he thought that it's only for industrial uh, industrial procedures that computers required. I don't know. Anyway, and also with that size of equipment, we won't want we won't want it in our house, but. So, uh, if we put him in today's day and age, 45 years later, can you imagine this person's reaction? So let's talk about patents. Again, I, I think we have scientists here. So we should know what is patentable. Any invention relating to product, process, product or process that is new, involves an inventive step and is capable of industrial application. So those are the three things. Imagine, and the fourth one is subject matter, uh, subject matter requirements. So imagine that there is a big plot of land and at the edge of that particular plot of land, there is a gatekeeper. And you go to them and say, I have, a, I have something that I want to patent. The first thing that gatekeeper is going to ask you is, is your invention new? Is it novel? So is it non-obvious? That means, does it have an inventive step? Inventive step meaning, if I take all the things that are existing on today's day, this one has to be one step above. It has to be, think of a physical step that takes you to the next level. So does it have an inventive step? And is it capable of industrial application? Is it useful? So let's say you tell that gatekeeper, yes, yes, and yes. So he says, okay, you can go inside to the next level. At the next level, there is another gatekeeper who asks you, which country are you from? Let's say you say India, someone else says US, and a third person says, I am from Germany, so I'm European. So for India, he will open the Indian Patent Act and tell you what goes on in Section 3. And he'll ask you a number of questions from Section 3. If you say you're you from US, he's going to ask you, he's going to say, please go on ahead, because US says any invention or discovery is patentable. And Europe has its own set. 
so these are this is the way patentability is judged and so i want to define what is a patent a patent is a right to exclude other from making using selling licensing for sale or importing the patented invention and so on it is not it does not automatically give you the right to use the invention it is a it is a negative right it says that you can exclude others it is a quid pro quo meaning you disclose everything to the government and the government offers you protection for 20 years per day we have covered this so when you think of inventive step this is what you are supposed to think of that everything that exists up until this it is on the black bar and you have to be the red arrow that jumps over so so the gate 1 questions are covered when you go to gate 2 i told you this is going to ask you which country you are from so the questions is going to ask you anything that is frivolous contrary to natural laws let's say perpetual motion machine we know it not exist 100% efficiency is not possible but we still say that oh i have a perpetual motion machine it's not patentable contrary to public law of morality so if i i have an invention the sole purpose of which is to pick pockets that is contrary to public order of morality next is mere discovery or abstract theory so mere discovery meaning if i say i was digging the soil in my backyard and i came across a new metal so that is a mere discovery because there is no intellectual input involved in it therefore that is not patent of them india 3d i have not left it out I, uh, i have not forgotten it i have left it out on purpose because i want to tackle it separately section 3e says no admixture so if i have somewhere where there is no synergy involved if i have salt and sugar which do not react chemically but i combine the two and i make lemonade then the two it's a mere admixture mere arrangement or rearrangement that means if i have an integrated circuit where resistance uh, where r1 r2 r3 arranged in series gives me effective resistance of 30 ohms then changing r1 r2 r3 the order of r1 r2 r3 around to still give me effective resistance of 30 ohms makes it a mere arrangement or rearrangement method of agriculture or horticulture why is this important this is important because if i start allowing patents for agriculture method of agriculture for growing plants in a particular way or for harvesting in a particular way india is an agrarian so when i allow patents such as uh, those relating to methods of agriculture or horticulture it negatively impacts farmers and therefore it is left out of the patent act medical surgical curative prophylactic diagnostic therapeutic methods of treatment why are all these uh, deleted or not allowed to be patented because we are a, our constitution says that we are a sovereign socialist secular democratic republic that socialist part means that we cannot start patenting these things because it will make these uh, medic, uh, medical surgical curative prophylactic diagnostic therapeutic methods of treatment unavailable to the poor therefore we don't allow it plants and animals you may say what's so strange about that why does it have to be written it has to be written because us has patented a mouse a transgenic mouse called onco mouse they have injected it with cancer genes and patented that but that onco mouse is not patented in other parts of the world so plants and animals we don't allow mathematical or business methods computer programs per se is a tricky substance tricky uh, section 
uh, because they don't automatically disallow it, but they don't automatically allow it either. There is quite a bit of hoops that you have to jump through. Literary, dramatic or musical work because those are covered by the Copyright Act. Method of playing games is also covered by Copyright Act. Presentation of information is also covered by Copyright Act. Topography of integrated circuits is covered by the Semiconductor and Integrated Circuits Act. Uh, traditional knowledge is was not in the act before, but people started, US people started uh, patenting Haldi and Neem and Kinwa. All of these are traditional knowledge um, assets of different countries. And since then, we have modified our act to not allow uh, traditional knowledge to be patented because then the indigenous people will suffer. And also because it is something that has been known for years and years, for centuries. So there is nothing novel and non-obvious about it. Novelty is certainly destroyed. Anything relating to atomic energy. And remember the 3D that I had deleted? 3D says mere discovery of a new form of a known substance or a new use of a known substance. And my favorite example for this is paracetamol. We know paracetamol is antipyric. That means it controls fever. But if today I realize that after two or three years of experimentation, I realized that paracetamol also cures cancer. Can I patent paracetamol again because it cures cancer? Under section 3D, no. I cannot patent once I've a new use for a known substance. And if I find a different form of paracetamol, a gel form or a wax form of paracetamol, uh, that does not, and that does not result in enhancement of the known efficacy, that does not result in how affect, how the paracetamol cures us then that cannot be patented. I can go on and on about section 3D, but that's a whole, I need a whole hour for just section 3D, right? So we'll go on to what a patent structure looks like. This is a common question that I have from acad people in academia. You have to start with the title, the field of invention. You have to explain what is the background. Then you talk about what are the deficiencies in the in the prior art and then you present a summary of your patent you provide the objectives what do you what does your patent accomplish when we have a section for description of figures a section with detailed description where you have all the various embodiments of your proposed invention claims and i've written claims in capital because this is the heart and soul of your patent document and it ends with the abstract and the figures. Claims were written in capital because the claims of a patent define the scope of the invention. We define, so think of it as a piece of land and you have, when you buy land, you have to first build a fence around it to show people that this is your land. So when I draft claims, I claim the edge. I don't claim the center. I don't draw a small circle in the center saying this. Claim drafting means covering the edge of your invention, fencing you in, and demarcating your invention from those of the prior art. Claim drafting is the most important part of your patent drafting because it is an art as well as a science. And you do need a patent agent or a patent attorney's assistance here because as an inventor, you, of course, your invention is precious to you, but you're looking at it with your inventor's lens. A patent attorney, even though they have subject matter uh, knowledge, even though they have domain expertise, they will still come and look at it with fresh eyes. So if you say that my invention is only going to work at pH 4, your patent attorney is going to say, what about 5? What about pH 6? What about pH 3? What about pH 2? And you're going to say, no, it doesn't work effectively. Even if it works at 20% efficacy and, and it hasn't been done before, I'm going to claim it for you. So your scope of protection has to be adequately mentioned. The 
technology, the problems with the existing technology that you're trying to solve have to be adequately conveyed to the patent officer and to the person who's reading that patent document. So claim drafting becomes very important and crucial in such cases. There has to be at least one claim in a patent and it defines the scope of the protection given to the owner. It has to be in the form of a single sentence and there are various claims depending on which area of technology you are uh, inventing in. So, for example, let's take the light bulb. Light bulb is a, a spherical chamber which is uh, which has uh, which has partial vacuum and it has a filament. Now, when Thomas Alva Edison was inventing, he was using carbon filament. So his independent claim was only carbon filament. If he had drafted his independent dependent claims properly, he would have said other materials similar to carbon. But he didn't. And there were other people who were inventing with other material filaments, such as tungsten and so on. And, and of course, Thomas Alva Edison ended up buying all of those patents. Uh, so the way you, uh, by not claiming all the other material filaments, he gave up this entire large circle. He only focused on carbon, saying that, oh, carbon works, and therefore I'm only going to talk about carbon. If the others didn't work, he should have claimed it just because they didn't exist. But then he was too late. We often wonder whether we should do go in for a patent or not, whether we should leave it as a trade secret. So how do I know when to do that? A quick test, you can run through the scenario in your head. It's called a Gedanken. A Gedanken is a thought experiment. So what do we do? I'm going to ask you to close your eyes. If you ask me, I have a technology for viewing the computer screen uh, in an efficient manner. So I'm going to say, okay, close your eyes and imagine how much time in today's day and age will it take to reverse engineer that concept? And how long will it take for competitor product to arrive in the market? So if you look at the first televisions that came into market, like the, the ones with the CRT, the cathode ray tube, how many years were they in the market as the only source, only type of television before your LEDs and LCDs and plasma and 4Ks and all came into the market? More than 20 years, right? And now the rate of change is so fast. Like today I have LCD, tomorrow I have something else, day after I have something else. It is the same for an app. If I, today I download an app to count the number of steps I take, how many days will it take, and measure blood pressure at the same time, how many days will it take for a, uh, a competitor's app to be out? Not more than a week, given that we are masters of Jugaad. So in that case, where it is of commercial use, where you are going to, you are making money out of it, but it can be copied easily, I will say, keep it as a trade secret. There is no trade secret law in India. It will have to be governed by contracts. And it is your responsibility to keep it under lock and key and not make it available to everyone in the company. The best example of trade secrets is Coca-Cola. So Coca-Cola was had vision. If they had taken a patent for the formula of Coca-Cola, they would have got it, but it would have been protected for 20 years. But Coca-Cola did not reveal it, it did not file for a patent. It has kept it as a trade secret for nearly a hundred years and no one has been able to obtain that formula. And thus it has been able to make, retain its monopoly in the market. And do you know that no two uh, upper level management of Coca-Cola travel in the same flight? And the formula is kept under lock and key in a safe place. Newer 
four types of intellectual property include domain name, which is an internet address. It is usually taken into Trademarks Act and protected over there. Design is a registration for the aesthetic look. It is not for the functionality. It is only for the aesthetic look of a product. And it gives you exclusive right for a limited term. And the remaining parts, uh, remaining forms of IPR are uh, semiconductor and integrated circuits, geographical indications, plant variety protections, uh, trade secrets, uh, which we already discussed in, a, in brief. So these are the forms of IPR. And what we're going to cover in the next session is going to talk about how to identify what is the IPR, what is the IP in our midst, and how to build an effective portfolio around it. IP management is what we're going to talk about in the second half. If you have any questions right now, I will be happy to answer your questions. Uh, thank you, ma'am, for an enriching session. Yeah. Any questions from the participants? Any questions? You can put it in chat box or you can just unmute yourself and speak. Hello. Hello, madam. Yes, sir. See, the, the, uh, we as a scientist, we are continuously attached with the activity of developing uh, and applying novel ideas so that uh, we get a solution to several problems related to biological systems. Now, uh, during the process, we get a lot of things and then we publish it. Hmm. After publication, is it possible to get the patents and all? No, sir. After publication, your patent, then once you publish it, your uh, patentable material has already gone into, become prior art. So, you will become your own prior art. I always suggest that you apply for a provisional patent and then go in for publication. See, uh, uh, other issue related to biological material. Most of the time we handle biological material. Wild strains are not patented, not patentable. It's the organism obtained from natural system. Right. But if we do if we do minor mutations, those mutants are patentable or not? Um, they can be. I will have to refer you back to Professor Chakravarti's patent, which was the first one. So in that case, it was entirely synthesized in the lab. But if you're trying to patent a living organism, that will be that will not be patentable. See, we are signatory of several conventions. Correct. Which are related to biological material. Can you give some uh, highlights on those issues? So that is going to be, can we take that as a separate conversation between you and me? Because that is going to take a lot of time. The, uh, what the NCBI says. Fine. Yeah. Thank you. Sure. Uh, we'll now have a break of um, around 10 to 15 minutes and we shall assemble for the second session at uh, 3.45. Uh, Ma'am would be taking second session on IP management for startups.
पूर्णिमा जस्ट हेलो यस सर जस्ट पुट दैट फ्लाई ऑफ या शो शो
I welcome you back uh, for the second session on IP management for startup. Uh, Ma'am Shalini, are you there? Shall we begin with the second session? Yes, ma'am. Yeah, thank you. I'll just close my screen so that uh, you can share your PowerPoint. May I start, ma'am? Yeah, sure. It's visible now. So our next session is on IP management. As we have seen in the earlier session, intellectual property reaches into everyone's daily lives. And therefore a basic awareness of what is IP and how it is essential for today's uh, students, researchers, teachers um, of tomorrow. It is very important that all of us become acquainted with the basics of IP so that we can benefit from it fully in whatever career we pursue. Students and universities in particular should be aware. You know, you cannot say that I'm not into technology, I'm not into business, therefore I don't need to know trademarks or I don't need to know this. You should be aware of how you can utilize this immense wealth of technical and commercial information uh, that is found in IP in the IP world. And <clears throat> we have to understand the need for universities to convert their research into IP rights, manage your IP portfolio effectively, and engage in technology transfer to industrial partners. Thereby, you will, of course, create value for yourself. You will create assets for yourself. And at the same time, you're benefiting society as a whole. And last but not the least, universities should be aware of the consequences of failing of what happens if you don't protect IP assets. What happens if you don't do IP management properly, you face the risk of reverse engineering, copying and industrial espionage. So this is where IP management comes into play. IP management contains the tools and information uh, that will make your IP game or IP journey complete. Let's talk about the four main pillars of IP. The management of IP is based on four main pillars that you see here. Creation, evaluation, protection, and exploitation. At universities, researchers are generally free to decide which kind of research they like to pursue, right? So creating commercial opportunities in this environment usually means that, uh, usually means you have to put into practice activities that provide high quality and proper invention disclosure. So let's start with awareness creation. Awareness creation is essential. It is, it is important under this awareness creation uh, topic that researchers should be aware of the importance of technology commercialization. They must recognize that they can initiate and support the commercialization process for the technology that they have created. Another component of this is teaching and training. Teaching and training, uh, researchers and admin staff, they should be enabled to support the commercialization in a meaningful way. Of course, faculties have to focus on research and training, right? So in order to do so, they need IPR support from the university for setting up collaborative contracts with third parties and funding agencies. Oftentimes, I see that uh, there is interest from uh, from the manufacturing side from the industry side but 
there is no system in place from the university side and therefore these fall through the cracks and don't ever see the light of day so whatever contracts that are in place they need to include suitable ip clauses that facilitate subsequent commercialization then we have technology scouting technology scouting is mostly done at universities with very high commitment to innovation so these universities have a technology transfer office what is abbreviated as tto uh, where they search actively search for technologies with commercial potential and there may be external triggers you know things going on in the real world that uh, influence these but generally uh, the tto uh, module is very model is very effective some universities have ip cells they offer micro or seed funding for technology refinement to increase the possibility of these technologies being commercialized if the commercialization succeeds inventors at universities are rewarded financially by receiving a share in the revenues some universities have innovation awards they have innovators days to publicly celebrate their in inventor success and achievements and therefore when we talk about ip management there has to be a creation of opportunities at the base level um evaluation of which of these opportunities or which of these ips actually need protection then actual protection of those ips and finally exploitation so what does implementing ip management mean for academicians the first thing to consider are the tools and processes careful and accurate documentation of creative developments is essential and there are a number of good practice procedures for researchers that need to be and should be put in place to help this process support can be you can obtain support from your technology transfer office if there is one on campus there should be one on campus ideally the tto office should be such that it will advise you and assist you with implementing good practices in the workplace they should provide you with proper document templates and last but not the least you should find out what is the ip policy for the university if you are involved in creation of ip you need to be familiar with the main rules guidelines and recommendations if you do not have an ip policy in place for the university when you enter into a collaboration you are forced to accept the other person's ip policy which may not always be to your benefit what are the typical it policies at university what do they comprise university it policies should cover a number of important aspects such policies should include reliable method to record innovative concepts and results how do you note down results and experimentation then maintaining confidentiality of those results is extremely important so processes in place for guarding proprietary information is required inventorship and ownership must be carefully evaluated and determined correctly what happens in other countries other universities they can own or can claim ownership of ip arising from their employees work and this is true for india too but students on the other hand who do not have a contractual relationship with the university most often own the ip they create and this is the case in other countries in india the situation is still gray and therefore the, this needs to be explained or this needs to be laid down in the ip policy the publication of research results is important as we were talking in as one of the questions in the earlier a uh, session was that uh, i already published in a journal before filing for patent publishing of results is extremely important for advancement of knowledge as well as for your individual career progression absolutely but where ip is concerned we have to exercise caution and we have to ensure that protection for the ip is in place before it is published processes for capturing and evaluating ip is Uh, are very important all
creations with a potential impact on society, which can adversely or beneficially impact society, should be reported to the Technology Transfer Office for review and evaluation. You need to be aware of the rights of collaborating partners and to ensure that these are not overlooked when you are talking about inventorship and ownership. And finally, under the university's IP policy, the revenues generated in the course of commercialization have to be split in a predefined ratio between the administration, the research unit, and the inventor. Now you will say, where is the startup kind of startup syndrome? I am talking about startups that are developed under the ages and protection of the university's IP cell. So we have to have that in place. IP management comes once you are creating IP and you are generating IP and how to be manage that. Let's talk about further tools and processes. So when we are talking about tools and processes for managing IP, we have uh, when managing IP arising from a research program or a piece of creative work, the focus should be on the ability to keep it confidential. The method of capturing it, the process of reporting it for evaluation and the form of protection is required. If you do need to disclose the work to third parties, make sure other people are not involved in the work, that are not involved in the work, then the first thing to do is to decide whether you need to keep it confidential. If you do want to do that, then ask the person to whom you're going to be disclosing to sign a non-disclosure or a confidentiality agreement. This is a good practice procedure for which enables you to exchange information in a professional capacity. I understand that there is a fear that that person is going to be helping us or mentoring us and therefore I may be stepping on their toes or I may be offending them. Please understand that professionals who are involved in this will not take offense. They should have a uh, an NDA or a confidentiality agreement of their own signed and ready for you. You should keep a notebook, work journal, design mock-up, storyboard, etc. to record the work you do on a daily basis. The IP created at a university should be reported or disclosed in accordance with your IP policy so that it can be reviewed for commercial potential and protection where appropriate. The invention disclosure form that if you have filed for a patent, you will you will be aware of this form, contains a standard set of questions to assist the process. And it is okay to realize that not every creation will result in an invention. Not everything leads to a patent. So the appropriate form of protection depends on the specific nature of the innovation. In other words, whether it's a patent or design or a trade secret or a copyright or a trademark, etc., the experts should provide advice in the on the form of protection required and how to manage the process. Together with the legal department, if there is one, they will advise you on what provisions should be in the contract if the research is done in collaboration with external partners. Notebooks and work journals. Uh, this is a very, very contentious area. Notebook is an extremely important source of key results and raw data, which can be used as a starting point to draft a patent application. So where there's a group of people who are working together on a project, the notebook entries are a valuable resource in deciding which of them are inventors and to what extent. When products are submitted for regulatory approval, entries can be used to verify that the experimental protocol, data collection methods, they were performed in accordance with the regulatory requirements. If there is a funding program that should, that may include a contractual obligation that the research is recorded in accordance with the stand, standard notebook procedures. When licenses are granted for patents and the associated know-how, the licensee will expect to have access to a record of the original research results and relevant experiments. Uh, I am in the middle of monetizing a pharmaceutical related patent and uh, one of the questions that we keep circling back on is, um, what, are the, what is the clinical trial data? And what have you compared it with the standard of care in that field? 
So we are going back and forth on the clinical trial results. The initial value of most early stage university spin out can be found in their intellectual assets. So notebooks play a very significant role in verifying what your assets are. Investors and purchasers will seek assurances that your notebooks are available and have been properly maintained. So we talked about invention disclosure form for universities and inventors. As we have already seen, any IP created at a university should be reported to your technology transfer office or to your IP cell. To do this, you should use an invention disclosure form which contains a standard set of questions. The commercial relevance of the invention is the most important and also the most difficult question as it will not make any sense to patent an invention if there is no potential for revenue or value creation. So the form will ask specific questions that will help to evaluate this. The patentability of the invention that we had discussed in the previous session, uh, remember the two sets of questions, uh, those questions will also have to be assessed. Inventorship on a patent is a legal requirement. So it is very important to determine who the inventors are. Ownership of the patent will stem from the inventorship. In most countries, employees who create inventions during the course of their work assign any patents and other IP to the employers. However, there may be exceptions to this. Again, we spoke about this in the previous session that if, uh, if it is outside of your job description and your scope of employment, then, then you don't have to share it with the university. Any assistance, information, software, materials provided by third parties need to be fully declared as these may have some, they may impact the inventorship and ultimately the ownership of the patent. The invention disclosure form captures information about the invention itself, including the inventive step and novelty. And this ultimately helps the patent attorney to evaluate the patentability of the invention and draft a proper patent application. Then we, are, then we have uh, proprietary information. If you think that there is some potential for value creation in your research findings, it is a good idea. And sometimes it is also legally required to talk to your IP assessment committee or your technology transfer office before you submit a paper to the journal or make any commitment to publish. If you've already prepared a draft paper, have it reviewed by the IP assessment committee or the technology transfer office and uh, for any content that may be relevant to a proposed patent application. The office can suggest edits to the paper that may avoid public disclosure of the invention and still allow a patent application to be filed. In fact, I have done this for one of the professors where we have filed a provisional patent application prior to having our uh, having our device on a public platform. So before you exchange any critical information with third parties such as companies or other research groups or in a competition or publication, you should always ask the recipients of the information to sign an NDA or a confidentiality agreement. Without this, the patentability of any invention relating to the information being discussed and disclosed will be seriously affected. You should be particularly cautious if you suspect that the recipients are working on a similar invention, because then there is a likelihood of contamination of information once it is disclosed. So in this case, it is better to avoid receiving information from them or disclosing your invention to them so that neither's work is contaminated. If you plan to exchange materials for such purposes, it is best to sign a material transfer agreement first. This allows you to control the use of your material under, under particular terms and conditions. Again, the technology transfer office, IP cell, IP assessment committee, whatever you want to call it, they should advise you on this and precautions, appropriate precautions should be taken. I'm going to just pause for a second here and have a sip of water. Right. So collaborations. How do we manage collaborations in IP management? 
before you undertake any collaborative projects, both parties or all parties involved, because sometimes it's more than two, they should agree on important terms they wish to control in the work and the output from that work. These items should then be set out in a multi-party collaborative agreement, which should include terms for management of that IP. Typically, what do these points encompass? The first point is to agree Point to agree is how the project IP will be defined. There will be various kinds of IP, right? Background, foreground, joint IP, improvements, and each part of the parties need to ensure that each has been clearly defined. The size of the project will determine whether one person or a committee is appointed to manage the IP. This will include recording, reporting, evaluation, protection, and commercialization. The agreement must also contain provisions for the ownership of inventions and access rights to the IP that is the highlight of the project, as well as the rights to use this IP for future research and for monetization and for commercialization. Once the project is completed, the parties may make improvements to the IP in question See if they need to decide if access rights will extend to these improvements. What will happen? What are the terms and conditions for the improvement? And commercial evaluation and patent protection are important parts of IP management. So the parties should decide who will file and prosecute and maintain any patent application. We have to bear in mind that filing and commercialization of patents can be an expensive business. So the parties need to agree upfront on how they want to share the cost risk and returns. The academic parties will almost definitely want to publish the results of the project, right? Because publishing is so important for it. So the protocol for reviewing and submitting publications needs to be agreed on in order to avoid conflict going forward. The next section is IP strategy. So in this section, we will look at some of the main strategies relating to the protection and to the development of IP. What we want to do here is to examine how companies use IP strategy, startups especially, to commercialize IP based on their specific business models. So let's talk about IP strategies for universities and businesses that arise from universities. Universities and businesses are, of course, fundamentally different type of organization. Each has their own set of activities, their own set of objectives, their own aims, and their approach to IP strategy. Universities are clearly focused on teaching and learning, passing on that knowledge through fundamental and applied research, disseminating this knowledge to benefit community and society. They typically have no production or sales activities. And in this sense, they are not the main users of IP. They're the main generators, but not the main users. Now, the more commercially relevant part of these knowledge dissemination activities, which relates to uh, creation and commercialization of the university's IP involves transfer of the knowledge that is generated in the university to the business community. Businesses, on the other hand, they are focused on developing marketing uh, selling a certain kind of product or service for a particular market, generating income from commercializing widely used technology, licensing, selling their IP. Therefore, they can be both users and brokers of their own IP. So it is obvious that IP is vital to both universities and businesses in that it plays a part in helping them acquire, in achieving their business goals and their mission targets so whatever overall business strategy they each develop, a well-defined IP strategy is an integral part of it. What are the IP strategy approaches then? IP strategy, we can look at it from two perspectives. In, in the first perspective, the focus is on the process of developing IP and deciding on the appropriate protection strategy for early stage IP, this is where most of universities' activities lie and where it usually focuses its decisions and strategies. Businesses that whose main focus is R&D 
also have an interest in determining the appropriate strategies here construct the second focus is uh, is directed at all functions and objectives relating to the commercial application of ip the commercial world the business world determines the specific ip strategy that is needed to engage in a particular technology area in a particular business sector or market and they their main aim is to optimize this ip for that particular business so this aspect of ip is is the uh, forms the core of university spin outs new technology startups business is already competing in the marketplace so universities usually do have a commercial strategy for out licensing and divesting themselves of their ip but it is different from that of the business obviously and they don't directly engage in development manufacture selling of products or services developing and protecting ip how do you go about doing this so firstly you have to decide whether you wish to monopolize or allow free access to your technology there are three options here one is to publish and make the technology available to everyone this prevents anyone from having a monopoly because once you publish it's out in public domain it's a prior art nobody else can take it wider applications of the technology stimulates the further invention innovation and hopefully for the improvement to it for the benefit of everyone the second objective is to protect the technology with patents and other forms of ip so this might create a monopoly for the owner as the patent grants the right to exclude others from using the protected technology the third is to maintain the technology as a trade secret we discussed this earlier a secret know how because the strong patents may not be granted or because you don't want the working of the invention to be publicly disclosed or that it can be easily reverse engineered so you have to take a call which one you want to do universities may have a strategy to maintain a patent application for a limited period only if they cannot find a licensee they invariably abandon the application to avoid further costs so they must have a strategy regarding whether they want to protect the invention in geographic where they want to protect the invention in which country and for how long patent owners should consider how to enhance the status of the initial invention by making it more commercially attractive so you can carry out additional research you can improve upon it create a valuable ip portfolio that ring fences the products and services so you have not just one patent but a bundle of patents that you can monetize and in this ip strategy lastly you can you have to create a competitive advantage how do you create a competitive advantage any company wanting to create a kind of monopoly they need an excellent overview of the ip landscape in that area of technology so it needs to know what ip competitors have what is being developed it needs pro uh, professional expertise and advice on whether its own products and technologies are free from infringement a typical ip strategy should also include processes for enforcing the company's ip you have to monitor com competitor activity you have to notify infringers of their ip status method for resolving infringement disputes could include mediation and licensing a business that uses patent portfolios as a competitive tool can prevent competitors from gaining the upper hand this is a defensive strategy that the business can apply together with a cross licensing strategy thereby reducing the risk of infringement obtaining finance many university spin outs and new technology startups they focus on building an attractive patent portfolio as a pool of valuable assets that can be offered as a collateral against investment revenue earning activities of course that's self explanatory and finally to maintain its competitive advantage a company may need to build its ip portfolio in areas where it has gaps so an open innovation strategy that involves collaborating with other companies with public research organizations with universities that undertake research it cannot complete in house uh, with research it cannot complete in house this way it can access new technologies and ip by means of acquisitions and licensing in the 
this IP strategy section, we spoke about strategies for enhancing and creating value in IP footprint. In the commercialization of IP, we look at the different ways in which uh, universities as well as companies can leverage their IP to create commercial opportunities. Now, there are many ways to extract. Uh, there are many ways to extract value from an IP portfolio. A technology transfer is usually the way universities ensure that their IP is used to the benefit of the business community. Companies may use their IP in a different way. They may use their IP to support their own product development and manufacturing activities. Or they may have a strategy to generate additional revenue from it. We will examine both of these possibilities. Creating value in IP for the purposes of investment is an important objective of university spin-outs and new technology startups as well. We had talked about monetization in one of the slides. So licensing is a common approach to commercializing IP and this concept will be, we'll talk about this concept also. It's something that I'm working on right now. Technology transfer. When in university sectors, as well as in publicly funded research organizations, what happens is new findings and advances in knowledge, they are disclosed by means of publication. This is the standard method for disseminating knowledge. Investigations, uh, but collaborations you have, if you have between large group of researchers at different organizations, allows a critical mass of skills and resources to advance complex and fast evolving technologies. Contract research, now that's a different form. It's a form of collaboration where the university conducts a defined, predefined piece of research on behalf of a company. So a lump sum is paid for the transfer of results, technology and IP to the company. In this case, licensing is the main activity universities. They enable commercially relevant IP to be transferred to the business community. In uh, now this way of conducting research and licensing it out is very prevalent in the West, but this is something that India should also be thinking about seriously. In another option, universities may not wish to retain ownership of a particular piece of IP and may offer to sell or assign ownership of it to another company for a lump sum payment. So how can universities exploit IP? This slide shows the processes involved in IP management. As you can see, exploitation op option plays a central role. The process begins after R&D with the disclosure of an invention. So we are here at the very top and then we go to invention disclosure. Then a full evaluation is carried out of the technology, the potential for strong IP and commercial opportunities. If the evaluation is positive, an application for the appropriate form of IP is filed. Before the technology can be protected, can be promoted, sorry, to the business community, it may sometimes be necessary to construct a uh, prototype. At each stage in the cycle, it is necessary to reaffirm, we have to keep ensuring and double checking that the commercial relevance is still valid before proceeding further. Eventually, the technology transfer office or your intellectual property assessment committee should make the initial contact with the uh, business owners or with the manufacturing sector and commence negotiation for transfer of technology to them. A license may be granted to a company for a specific application of the technology relevant to the sector. Sometimes the company is interested in acquiring ownership of a particular patent. And if the deal is good, then there is no harm in selling the patent. Another option is to support the formation of university spin-out companies by staff members and to transfer the technology to these companies, either by license or by assignment. So we are talking about evaluating IP. Any evaluation of IP must focus on legal status, technology, and market condition. Evaluation of legal status includes, it's also known as due diligence. Questions about patent status, ownership, enforcement means, and so on. Evaluation of the technology should include questions on its uniqueness, its stability, 
the productability, if it is superior to substitute technology, how easy it is to identify infringing products. The most crucial but also most difficult part of the evaluation is to gain a proper understanding of the market dynamics. So your questions should include what are the commercial opportunities? What are the marketing options? Is it free freedom to operate easily achievable? How big are the margins, turnovers, market growth rates, and so on? The IP evaluation process is a little bit more complex. Based on the often preferred cost delaying strategy for obtaining patent protection, we can draft a typical time scale for prosecution of patent application, during which the three main evaluation milestones occur. The first is the date of filing. The second is the start of international application. And the third is the start of national phase. So for this, I'll have to go into PCT application in detail in a little bit, but let's, let's try to get a bird's eye view of it. Before an IP owner decides to go to the next milestone and consequently invest the money required for the patent attorney and patent office filing fees, he needs to evaluate the technology with respect to alternative options for the allocation of his resources. So at each stage of evaluation, the same basic questions are asked more or less, but the answers should provide more clarity each time they are asked. Although the questions are basically always the same, the answers will not be the same. For example, if I'm talking of product development based on new technology for the uh, for a particular market, it needs to be at an advanced stage to gain approval for further, let's say we're talking of AI, then it has to be at an advanced stage to gain approval for further investment. On the other hand, for the pharmaceutical market, they are influenced by a different set of factors, life cycles, margins, regulatory requirements, licenses, and so on. So they would normally have much longer uh, time spans. So a proposal for pharmaceutical business, new business launch may obtain financing for clinical trials several years in advance of the market launch of the, of the drug actually being developed. So now we come to a similar, uh, to the same diagram, and we talk about how businesses exploit IP. I'm sorry about the diagram. My uh, When I changed from PowerPoint to Adobe, for some reason, my PowerPoint does not work on uh, Google, Google Meet, so I convert to Adobe, uh, so the picture went a little all right. Uh, so this slide illustrates the ways in which companies use their IP to support their main business needs. So this includes internal strategies, protecting product, process, or service application that are the core of the business. The main business case is usually based on selling products, processes, and services. An additional component involves partnerships in the form of supply or manufacturing agreements, merger and acquisition deals. And as with universities, another possibility is always licensing. How a company may create new revenue earning opportunities by offering licenses for specific applications of its technology to companies it is not competing with. Then we come to spin-outs. Spin-outs are businesses that are arising from labs that are in universities. So when companies are unable to exploit a unique product or technology, because it is not aligned with their core business, they often spin off that sector of the business by forming a new company to exploit the new opportunity. Next, a company may have IP that is redundant, that is, uh, it has acquired through mergers, or because it has changed its business focus and no longer requires certain patents. It can offer this IP for sale or auction and assign ownership to the new purchaser. And last but not the least, there is investment. In the section on IP strategy, I had talked about how a set of valuable IP assets can be used as collateral to raise investment from a range of sources such as private investors, uh, business angels, venture capital companies, and financial institutions, and so on. So we'll talk about IP, licensing IP. In, uh, in our previous session, we learned that IP rights are legal rights that can be used to prevent others from using your invention. So patent owners can control the rights to use the IP by means of license agreements containing an agreed set of terms and conditions. Certain conditions 
must be met for license to constitute a legal agreement. There should be a mutual exchange of a bargain, a consideration such as money, licensing fee, royalties, something exchange of values, and a set of terms and conditions that make clear the intentions of both parties. What are the benefits of licensing? Benefits of licensing for the licensor include the opportunity to create a new source of revenue by leveraging IP, to gain access to new territories and markets, also by offering licenses to leading firms in the sectors, licensors can influence uptake and acceptance in the market as the preferred technology. They can use licensing to increase production capacity. For licensee, the benefits of licensing include gaining access to new technology, turnkey products and processes without undertaking the risk of investing time, money, and resources. The licensee's business gains a competitive advantage by introducing new product offerings without that extended time that has gone into research. And the licensed IPRs are effectively a new asset for the business, which will increase the value of the company on the balance sheet and which it can leverage in financial deals. Now let's talk about spin-outs again. The decision to set up a spin-out relies relies on a combination of four main conditions. Firstly, that the technology has been, it has to first, we have to show that the technology works successfully for the, whatever it is intended for. Secondly, that the commercial potential has been researched and the market opportunity has been confirmed. And thirdly, that the technology has been secured with, it's been protected by whatever IP is applicable. And fourthly, that the management team has the right skills and expertise. Generally speaking, what happens is that new companies, they lack cash flows and they require investment from outside. So the IP and the team will be the only assets they have to leverage to get financing. So it is a very important element in influencing the decision to form a startup. Investors need to be very sure that the assets that are underlying the company's technology are protected properly. That is the first thing they will check. It is these IP assets in combination with the team that ultimately secure a kind of monopoly for the company and diminishes the risk for the investors. Only then will they be ready to invest. So let's, now we have studied so much about strategy and exploitation and so on. Let's take a, a case study so that all these terms, new things that we have learned, uh, it becomes a little clear. So I like to talk about this real life event, which turns into a case study. And I, I like it because I think it highlights some very practical elements that show how if you have a casual approach to IP management, it can have serious implications on the commercialization. So this case study is the story of a research group that was working on developing a treatment for cancer. During the project, one of the researchers had a conversation with a former colleague regarding the biological material. I think Garg sir was asking me about biological material. So this case is right up his alley. So the researchers had a conversation with former colleague about a biological material she required for her experiment. He said, oh, we are friends. I will give you the material that I have developed and I think it will work in the project. Wonderful. The project finished and there was an interesting finding that was thought that might have potential benefits in the treatment of cancer. Now this finding became the subject of a patent application. Now there was a lack of management of IP because how that material was transferred was not taken into account. Incorrect inventorship arose, a fact which had significant financial consequences for the owner and the licensee of the invention many years later. So the objective of this story is to illustrate what can go wrong when researchers engage in the exchange of information without following protocols. Uh, now I'll tell you about the different events that happened in the story. And I want you to think about how things might have been done differently and what procedures you think can be put into place to avoid the mistakes that happened. And then we can discuss these at the end of the slides and see what lessons we have learned from this unfortunate set of unfortunate story. So the story begins in 1987. 
at the Wiseman Institute of Science in Israel. A group was studying a Sela, conducting research on treatments for cancer using the method of attaching the chemotherapeutic drugs to monoclonal antibodies. Now, don't ask me the meaning of this. I am merely telling you the story. So that the treatment could be targeted to the specific site of the cancer. Now, a former colleague, Professor Schlesinger, paid a visit to the institute. And after a meeting with one of the researchers, said, oh, I'll send you the antibodies uh, that I have made that will be useful for you. It was very promising. And Sela's group prepared a paper for publication. Meanwhile, Schlesinger's group drew up a patent application. The patent was eventually licensed to a pharmaceutical company. to a pharmaceutical company for the commercialization of cancer treatment. Now, when Professor Sela discovered that his group's research had resulted in a patent, a dispute ensued. This dispute was not resolved and ended in litigation in the courts of New York, which proved very costly for the companies that owned and licensed the patent. So, as I mentioned, the objective of Professor Sela's research was to develop treatments based on a method for targeting the drug, drug treatment to a particular site of the cancer. Professor Schlesinger, a former employee, was a former employee of Sela, was working on sabbatical leave at a U.S. biotech company, had made monoclonal antibodies, and agreed to send two such antibodies to the group to test in their experiment. The group did some preliminary testing and selected one of the antibodies to use in the research product project. In chemically linking some known chemotherapeutic drugs to the antibody, the theory was that the antibody would carry the drug straight to the cancer cells, where it would work more efficiently than the traditional drug administration therapies that were in place. So in a series of experiments, the, a tumor was implanted in mice to see which of the treatments would be most effective in inhibiting growth of the tumor. I have four experiments. In experiment A, the selected chemotherapeutic drug was injected on its own. In experiment B, antibody was injected on its own. In experiment C, conjugate of the antibody and the chemotherapeutic drugs uh, are injected. And in D, the antibody and drug were combined in a mixture in which, in which they were not chemically linked and injected. So C is where they were conjugated and D is where they are a simple mixture. In each of the experiments, A, B, and C, there was some evidence of growth inhibitions. But when D was completed, it was evident that this provided the most efficient growth inhibition. There was a synergistic effect that was observed where the inhibition on tumor growth was far greater than the sum of the two separate substances acting alone. So that was a brilliant discovery. So let's see what the results say. We, the researchers were, of course, exp expecting experiment C, the one where they were conjugate to work best because they expected the drug to be delivered directly to the site of the tumor. But they were surprised that D produced the best effect. And it demonstrated a superior inhibitory effect on tumor growth. They, they had not predicted this, and so it was surprising and inventive. Now, Sela did not think of patenting this invention because the antibody that they had used was the property of rural biotechnology where Schlesinger was working on sabbatical. So Sela felt that it would be too much paperwork involved and getting approval, internal approval, complex negotiations with Rora, etc. So he said, I will just publish it and let the scientific community benefit from it. So they, that Sela's group prepared a publication and on his next visit, provided Schlesinger with a draft copy in which he was named for his contribution for the acknowledged for his contribution of the antibodies. And it was published in the Journal of National Cancer, Cancer Institute in December 1988. Now, now there's a twist in the story. When Schlesinger returned to the US, he discussed the draft paper with his colleagues and decided that the company should submit a US patent application. So they began clinical trials, prepared a submission for FDA approval. Patent application was drafted where they included claims for the protection of the rural antibodies, but it had also claims for mixture of antibodies with chemotherapeutic drugs precisely the inventive step that Sela's group had demonstrated 
showing the synergistic effect that experiment D of the mixture. And only Rohrer's inventors were named in this application. Unknown to the Wiseman Institute, the application was filed in September 88, just before the publication of the Wiseman Institute paper by Sela in December 88. The prosecution of the patent was a lengthy process and it was finally granted in 2001. Now, a patent is valid for 20 years. So, September 88, 98, 2008. It is only valid till September 2008 and it was only granted by the US, uh, US uh, Patent Office in 2001. Now, what happened in the meantime? In the meantime, in 1994, an exclusive license was granted to another company who invested a huge sum in, the, in developing cancer theory. Through a series of acquisitions and mergers, the patent changed ownership over a number of years, finally becoming the property of Aventis in 1999. The drug that was eventually developed was called Erbitux. It was approved by FDA for the treatment of colorectal cancer in 2001. Now, what happened to the patent dispute? The US patent was granted in 2001 under the number uh, US 6217866. So the claims granted were to the mixture of antibody and drug only. However, in other countries, directed, the claims directed to treatment using the rural antibodies only and to use of the mixture were allowed. Professor Sela was surprised <coughs> and he was upset to learn that a patent application had been filed which was based mainly on the work carried out by his group. The technology transfer company that represents Wiseman Institute was, form, was formed. It initiated discussions with Aventis and with the other company that put 190 million to have the Wiseman scientists named as inventors, but they did not want to share the ownership and a resolution was not forthcoming. And in 2003, that technology transfer institute commenced uh, legal proceedings. So the technology transfer office's name was Yeda. Yeda claimed that the invention relating to the mixture was based on experiments designed and performed by the by Sela's group. It also pointed out that the patent specification had been drafted using figures and text co copied from Sela's group uh, work, uh, notebooks, and they had prepared for publication of results. Now you see why uh, keep maintaining a notebook is important. The initial motivation was to have the patent corrected for joint ownership. However, during prosecution of the patent, these claims were not allowed by the US Patent Office. Yeda then changed its case to full ownership of the patent as the rural scientists had not contributed to the mixture experiments. That was only the only the Sela's group. So the Aventis defense was that Schlesinger and rural scientists were the two inventors as they provided the antibodies. And Schlesinger claimed that he advised the Wiseman scientists on conducting research projects. Therefore, it is his brainchild. So you see how messy these things can become. The court's decision on reviewing the, so the laboratory notebooks were brought as evidence and both sides researchers were heard. The judge found in favor of the Wiseman scientists as being the sole inventors. She requested that the patent be corrected for inventorship at the USPTO to show only Sela's group scientists as the inventors. In 2007, the parties reached an out-of-court settlement. Yeda was the owner of the U.S. patent. Patent granted outside the U.S. contained claims to the use of both mixture and antibodies, like in uh, experiment D. And for this, it was agreed that the patent should be jointly owned. It was also agreed that Aventis and that I am clone, that's the other company which had put in $190 million, would each pay a lump sum of $60 million to Yeda. Additionally, in return for worldwide exclusive license, I am clone agreed to pay Yeda a royalty on the sales of Urbitux. And, and for sale of the drugs outside US, this is not important. I am clone would I am clone would pay royalty to both Aventis and Yeda. So the particulars of who paid whom, how much is all unimportant. What is important for us is to realize that how complicated this can become. We learn that. Uh, we learn a valuable lesson from this. The judge in that case stated that conception is the touchstone of inventorship, the completion of the mental part of the invention. What does she mean by this? 
the argument that we have to consider in determining the inventorship is who contributes to the inventorship. The concept in this regard is the mental process of repeating the invention. That means you have to be able to replicate it. So in other words, the inventor discovers the important steps that give rise to the inventive step and has a mental idea, a mental concept of what needs to be done physically to make it work. So in this invention, that is the act of combining that antibody with a chemotherapeutic drug in a free mixture. That was the inventive step. The dependence arguments for entitlement to inventorship, etc., that I gave the antibodies, etc., and if I had not given antibodies, there would be no invention. The judge's response was that the outcome of what happened merely because of a person's contribution, just because I give you stones or uh, lacquered stones to build your house does not make me the owner of your house. What you do with it and how you build with it is that's what makes you the actual owner. So Professor Schlesinger and his colleagues had no records to show that they had performed or in any way influenced that mixture part, that experiment D. Nor that there was any collaboration with respect to that concept. So what, what procedural steps might have been introduced in the two organizations involved that could have prevented the situation of incorrect inventorship arising? This is something we need to think about. And of course, if this was a face-to-face -face seminar, we could have discussed this and there, it could have been a very engaging chat, but I'm hoping that post the talk now, we can discuss this if you all have any ideas. I have a couple more slides that I'm going to end with just to wrap this up neatly. So the lesson learned in this is the first issue is to consider, the first issue to consider is failure to sign an NDA. They did not sign an NDA. The second is to consider the failure to sign material transfer agreement. Why did they not trans, uh, draft a material transfer agreement for exchange of antibodies? The, uh, that was uh, cru um, crucial to the final result in Sela's project. And it gave rise to the creation of a very commercial invention. Now, all that was tainted because all that MTA was not signed, material transfer agreement. The third problem in this uh, whole case study is the failure to use an invention disclosure form. Most organizations in business and academia, I use one myself. The first thing I do is give my inventors an invention disclosure form. It helps them capture and evaluate the invention. It helps them explain the invention and think through the inventive step. When this in information is analyzed, it determines who the inventor is. So if Rohrer had asked uh, Schlesinger to complete an invention disclosure form, that invention would have started the first question of who came up with this technology, but he did not do that. And finally, the most important evidence in this case is documentation. Where is the project planning, experimentation? What are the steps? You know, you know, and we know as scientists that we do repeated experimentation until we get a consistent result. And relating to, so where is that experimentation relating to that mixture experiment? This is where the concept of invention originated. The lab notebooks at Sela's lab had been properly maintained with all the relevant entries relating to the work. Schlesinger and his colleagues, on the other hand, had no records because they had not either with, either that they had formally collaborated with Weizmann Institute or that they had pro performed or influenced this mixture experiment. They didn't because they hadn't done it. Right? So the lesson learned is use an NDA, use an MTA, complete an IDF, and keep proper notebooks. Now. Again, I think my slide has gotten a bit, I think, bit uh, mangled, but I will read you through this. So that is as universities. Now as startups, the questions you should have is before you, for IT management is, will patents facilitate venture capital investments? Will they help me defend myself against attacks by my rivals? Will they stop theft of my innovations? Will they ensure that I have freedom to operate? Will they help me increase my market share quickly? Can these patents help me join, form joint ventures with other companies? Will they increase the chance that my startup will be acquired? Can 
पेटेंट से हेल्प माय स्टार्टअप गेट रेडी फॉर एन इनिशियल पब्लिक ऑफरिंग विल स्टार्टअप विद इंटेलेक्चुअल प्रॉपर्टी अचीव लॉन्ग टर्म सक्सेस दैन स्टार्टअप विदाउट इट वॉट इज द केस स्टडी ऑन दैट कैन पेटेंट हेल्प स्टार्टअप लॉन्च अ बिलियन डॉलर एम्पायर so these are the questions startups have and there is no fixed answer for this but let's walk through some of the options and these are the last couple of slides and we'll conclude the first step right after you have started your business or even before that is to see what is your competency level can you manage your ip issues on your own if you have a slightest doubt please consult a professional there are several cases that i'm dealing with where people have filed for a trademark or a patent on their own and then they realize they are not able to keep up with the follow up step so they come to me now the problem is there is a second problem to this i have no problem in taking these cases but when i have to file a power of attorney saying that i am taking these cases over now any kind of extra paperwork upsets the indian patent office or the indian trademark office so that uh, file goes into pending category for longer now the uh, patents and trademarks that i have filed from scratch where i have a uh, uh, advised and filed all the paperwork gets granted in 2 years or less whereas the ones that the patents that have been filed much before that by the individual inventor and then they have come to me has been in abeyance because of the extra forms that are filed so consult a professional try to identify every possible aspect assets you have in your company that you want to protect make a list of it a written list of it and make it in paper and pen so you can circle and cancel and draw around that as around that list of assets go through all your findings to see which of them are really worth protecting compare the potential gain you expect to get from your asset against the expected cost don't just say that oh this is expensive i don't want to do this start with there is so we do a valuation i'm a certified patent valuation analyst as well as i'm getting a phd in valuation from goa university come and talk to me about what is the value of your asset versus the expected cost choose the right form of protections i think now we have gone through enough seminars uh, that uh, tell us which is the right form of ip for what kind of asset it is important to choose the form of protection that are best suited for each of them and decide in what ways you are going to protect which ip and how right and there should be budget allocation for that start the actual protection process see the more, more you think about it the more complex or the more intimidating it seems but if you start the process then it goes it, you know things fall into place easily raise financing if you need to approach the approach uh, msme uh, department msme government schemes to raise finances for yourself if you need to there are a lot of schemes available for startups these days and remember through all steps 1 through 7 the importance of confidentiality importance of mta importance of idea and importance of notebook and that concludes my talk today i went a little over time but i hope you all enjoyed the uh, session i certainly did thank you participants please ask question thank you madam for the interact uh, this two sessions uh, i have couple of questions it's already 450 i'll just uh, ask quickly one or two question see for startup mostly the startups are uh, many of them are basically uh, got some idea and they are trying to the tdi to put in the market right and uh, they are mostly dependent on financial support from the agencies either government or bank right so uh, will uh, filing patent will give some edge to these people or no if there is something worth 
uh, that comes under the domain of patent patentability then yes of course they should file a patent but sometimes uh, you know the, the a true a proper patent agent will attorney will uh, advise them properly saying that look there is nothing patentable in this. so go ahead and start your business not everything can be patented and not everything should be patented either so uh, again that is a question for uh, the startup to see which area of technology they are in. If it is something that is pharmaceutical related, then I think 99% of the time the answer would be yes, patent is good. So if it is in the case of software or electrical engineering or some place where reverse engineering is rampant, then the answer would be no, maybe, uh, patenting is not required. Second question is uh, related to incubators. See, uh, what happens when uh, uh, an entrepreneur is there or some idea is there and uh, they go to incubator with the help government support. Right. And the, in the incubator, they develop a technology. Okay. Now, this technology, will the incubator who is supporting this activity will get a share of the it government? Government? It depends. It depends on what, under what terms and conditions the incubator has taken you on. There are some incubators I know in the US that don't take a share of the profits. There are some incubators that say that we want equity. So it depends on what is the incubator's stand on these things. Thank you, madam. Anybody want to ask any question? Snigda, please ask. Uh, hello, ma'am. Thank you for the lovely informative uh, presentation. My question is uh, with regards to the startups. If a startup company wants to acquire a patent that is already granted to some institution, such as a university, what are the steps that one would take to acquire such a patent? Okay. So for this, there is no such, or no such service being provided in India, but we have launched patented network which does exactly this. We will bring the patent, uh, we will conduct a due diligence on the patent and we will uh, conduct all the necessary transactions. So if the startup gets in touch with us saying, this is the patent that we're looking for, we will conduct all further steps on their behalf and obtain the patent for them. Okay, okay, ma'am. Thank you. Sure. Any more questions? Mansi, please give the vote of thanks. Yes, sir. Am I audible? Yes. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Advocate Shalini Menezes, ma'am, for this wonderful workshop. I will briefly summarize the both the sessions. In the first session, ma'am talked about what is intellectual property, the bundle of rights, and various concepts such as copyright, trademark, and industrial property, and so on. She also clarified about what exactly a copyright or a trademark protects and uh, uh, the concepts of copyleft and creative commons at work was also explained. Uh, the story about the macaque and the conflict of intellectual property and copyright was a really interesting tale, ma'am. And it was very informative and helpful to know about patenting and the patent structure process. In the second session, ma'am talked about IP management as well as the four pillars of IP management. She also told about IP policies at universities and the significance of record keeping to protect innovative data. IP management in collaborative works was also explained. I'm sure everyone would surely benefit from uh, listening to the tale of IP evaluation process and the case study, which gives a better understanding of all these concepts that you had previously explained. So I would like to extend our hearty gratitude to Advocate Shalini Menezes, ma'am, for accepting our invitation and sharing her valuable knowledge with us. Thank you so much, ma'am. Thank, thank you. Also thank you. I also thank Professor Sandeep Kar, Director, DI3P Goa University, as well as Dr. Poonima Dhune for organizing and coordinating today's sessions, respectively. I'm grateful to all the attendees for their active participation. Have a wonderful day. Thank you. Thank you, Mansi. Thank you, madam.
thank all to all the participants. Thank you, sir. We'll take the lead. Yeah, have a good evening.